Apollo 8 would be the first manned trip to the moon. Without the LEM, there would be no landing, but their flight would still be an important symbolic victory. The crew was comprised of two veterans and a rookie. Bill Anders would be flying his first mission. Frank Borman and Jim Lovell had previously spent 14 days together in Earth orbit aboard Gemini 7. Both appreciated the roomier new Apollo vehicle. On the eve of the mission, the crew was visited by another pioneer, a man who'd forever changed his own world some 40 years earlier, aviator Charles Lindbergh. We compared his flight to Paris uh, with our flight to the moon, and, and we talked to him about how we had this four gimbal or this three gimbal platform and how we were going to do all this uh, inertial navigation and things like that. He told us how he planned his fuel load by taking a piece of string at a library and putting one end on the New York and the other end on Paris to figure out how much fuel he needed. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I said, well, you know, the fuel you had in, in, in the spirit of St. Louis would even start our engines in the, <laughs> in the Saturn V. This was the first Apollo mission to be launched with the massive Saturn V booster, the most powerful machine ever built. 36 stories tall, it contained more raw power than a small atom bomb. At T minus six seconds, the five engines ignited and built to a thrust of more than seven million pounds. Inside the spacecraft, things are kind of quiet. And all of a sudden, as the count goes down to zero, but you hear the valves start to open up and these manifold uh, tubes are big things. You can hear the fuel start to rumble down into where the rocket's uh, engines are. And then suddenly, of course, there's the rocket ignitions and you hear this vibration and the, and the, the, the sound vibrate right through the whole vehicle itself. The rocket strained against its hold down clamps until its own internal computer was satisfied that all was running properly. At T minus zero, the rocket was released. For a machine that would eventually reach 25,000 miles an hour, the first few inches seemed to stretch out forever. Water vapor in the damp Florida air had condensed and frozen on the super cool liquid oxygen fuel tanks. Now, as the giant rocket gathered speed, thick sheets of ice broke loose from the vibration, showering down on the launch pad. Well, it was, a, uh, it was an experience that was much more uh, so, so I don't want to say challenging because we just sat there and got bumped around. But it was you, you really knew you were on a bigger machine than you were in Gemini. The first stage engines burned nearly 4,000 gallons of fuel per second, generating more power than every hydroelectric dam in the United States combined. As the first stage became lighter, the rocket climbed faster and faster. Its exhaust plume widened in the rapidly decreasing air pressure nine miles up. Uh, you feel the G-loads, but, but uh, the higher you get, uh, the less sensation of speed that you have. The Saturn V's third stage ignited. Apollo 8 gradually accelerated to an orbital velocity of just under 18,000 miles an hour. The crew circled the Earth every 90 minutes, checking out systems and waiting for the final word from Mission Control. The lunar journey hung in the balance. It was an apprehensive time for a lot of us. But on the other hand, we didn't know, not, we didn't know that we couldn't do it. Remember, I mean, 
All these things were being done for the first time and nobody, nobody had ever told us that we couldn't put men on the moon. So we were gonna do it. <laughs> Nearly three hours after liftoff, Mission Control radioed the words that all three astronauts were waiting to hear. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. TLI, or translunar injection. Apollo 8 was go for the moon. The third stage engine was reignited. This burn lasted just over five minutes. When it was complete, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders were traveling at seven miles a second. They had become the fastest human beings in history. Of course, our, our uh, departure from the Earth right after the uh, burnout of the third stage is a little bit less than 25,000 miles an hour. But, you know, speed is relative. Velocity is relative. Uh, just sitting here on Earth, not moving, we're doing a thousand miles an hour anyway, going east along with the Earth rotation. Uh, and so uh, one of the things I think that most of uh, us in the space program learned that everything in life is relative. For three days, the crew crossed the quarter million miles between the Earth and the moon. They viewed sights that no human had ever seen before, sites that would change the perspective of mankind. Being on Apollo 8, being the first flight to uh, see the moon, but more so to see the Earth as it really is, was perhaps the high point of my space career. Uh, to see the only color that I could notice in the universe, which was the Earth with the, you know, of course, the, the, ocean, the blues of the ocean and then the white of the clouds, but then you can see the, the pinks and the salmon colors, the tans and the browns of the land areas. Don't see green because the, uh, that, the green frequency is absorbed by the atmosphere as it goes through. It's sort of like a blue haze. Apollo 8 entered the moon's gravitational pull tail first. The astronauts wouldn't be sure they had reached their destination until the rising sun reveal the moon below them. Actually, we came towards the moon on Apollo 8 with our blunt end. Uh, the first thing that we realized that the moon had hold of us, the ground said, at such and such a time, and they gave it down to the second, you'll lose communication with us because the moon will start to pull you around the far side. Uh, and they were absolutely right. Right to the second, we lost communication. Well, we did not see the moon at that particular time. Uh, all we saw was a black velvet sky. And uh, it wasn't until we rotated the spacecraft 180 degrees that we saw that just 60 miles below us uh, was, the, uh, uh, was the lunar surface. And you know we were like three school kids looking at a candy store window at that time. <laughs> 